All right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Welcome to the Texas Science Festival. We are here to share a virtual tour of the Hobby Eberly Telescope located at the McDonald Observatory uh, out in far west Texas. We are part of the University of Texas at Austin, though. Uh, my name is Martinique Poutsky. I'm on the outreach team at the McDonald Observatory Visitor Center. I graduated from Minnesota State University Mankato with a degree in education. My co-host, so where did you get your degree? I actually got it right here. I graduate from, my name is Saul Rivera. I graduate from University of Texas at Austin, Hookham, Hookham, uh, with a bachelor's in astronomy and a minor in Spanish. Now, throughout the program, we have mods in the chat who are ready to answer any questions you may have. If it's a question they can't answer or feel it'll be better to be answered later on, they'll send it to us to answer at the end of the show. And while, while that's going on, we might have people from all over. So feel free to drop in a chat where you're from. Are you from Texas, the US, maybe even outside the US? Let us know. And even though the observatory it's here is part of the University of Texas at Austin, we're very far away from Austin. We're out in far west Texas near a small town called Fort Davis. And it is important that we are way out here. I've got another question. Drop in the chat, y'all. When can we see? The stars. I got one answer for you. <laughs> it doesn't just need to be dark, though. We also need some clear skies, and that is what we have out here. We are far away from all those cities. I've got an image here to show y'all. This shows the light pollution in Texas, and y'all can see those bright regions line up with some of the cities in Texas, Houston, Dallas area, El Paso even. Uh, so we are far out in that darker area, this yellow dome is us out in far west Texas. So we are far away from light pollution. Uh, in those areas, those cities, a lot of places there is light that isn't well pointed, right? Maybe not pointed down where you're walking. Um, also maybe not well covered, which allows the light to shine up into the sky. And when all that light is shining up into the sky, we start washing out those stars. So it's really important to maintain those dark skies. Uh, our own Bill Wren and Stephen Hummel actually are our dark sky specialists, and they work all hours of the day and night uh, to help share smart, uh, dark sky friendly lighting. So uh, if we were to go outside your house, I kind of wonder, uh, how would your lights be? Are they pointed down where you're walking or up in the sky? What kind of grade would you get? Uh, if you want more information about dark skies, we do have information on our website. You can check us out there. But that is not the only reason that we are out here, not just dark skies. Yeah, the other reason we are out here is because it's clear. We are in the Chihuahuan Desert, so we don't have that many issues with rain clouds or humidity, which can impede observation. So with so many clear skies, we can get lots of good nights of research. The other reason we're in this area is because of our altitude. We're about 6,791 feet above sea level. And the reason we build our telescopes high up on mountains is actually because of our air and atmosphere. So our air and atmosphere distort light. You see this most often at nighttime when you see stars twinkle. The reason stars twinkle is that they're so far away they become what we call a point source of light. As that little point goes through our atmosphere and through the turbulence or vibrations of the atmosphere, they get all shaken about giving the appearance of twinkling. The higher up you are, the less air and atmosphere you're looking through, and the better data you can collect, because there isn't as much twinkling. And speaking of our altitude, being 6,791 feet above sea level, that puts us on the summit of Mount Locke. So here's an image of Mount Locke, and you can see several domes scattered about. The Biggest ones being the 82-inch Alice Thurway Telescope on the left and the 107-inch Harlan J. Smith Telescope on the right. The Alice Thurway Telescope was the first telescope built up here, opening first light in 1939. You might also notice some of the other domes scattered about. They are just some of the other research telescopes. You might try to count to see how many. And the other dome, big dome, is the 107-inch Harlan J. Smith telescope, which is on the right. Installed here in 1968, well, opening first light officially in 1968, I should say, 
and actually helped out with the lunar laser ranging experiment. So basically, we attached a billion watt laser to the telescope, shot at the moon, made it hit a reflector that was left behind by the Apollo astronauts, and after hitting the reflector, the light bounced back, and we timed how long that took. And then we were able to calculate how far away the moon was to an accuracy of about four inches or so. Nowadays, that accuracy is closer to half an inch. And that uh, laser telescope has actually been upgraded. Uh, since it was on our 107-inch telescope, it moved over here to Mount Folks. Uh, you can see in this little dome right there was our other laser ranging site, which was decommissioned in the last year or two. And we actually installed a new laser ranging telescope that will be up in the next few months, we're thinking. Uh, this image of Mount Folks is a little dated. We need another helicopter to, to fly around. So if y'all have any helicopters, call us. Um, you can see in this image, we've got one little dome in the, the lower right, that white dome, and a few spaces just next to it, empty spots where we were ready to get some more telescopes out here. Uh, Stephen Hummel shared a picture with us. We got a few more domes on this image. You can see that original white one, and we got another white dome on one of those empty spaces on the left. This is another one back there, a little barn door that opens up the top. Uh, and this new dome here is the new laser ranging site. Uh, that laser ranging site is part of the McDonald Geodetic Observatory. Um, it's part of NASA's Space Geodesy Project, so learning about Earth with astronomy. Uh, and with that project, we got a laser a radio dish installed, uh, also Stephen's image. I don't know why his name's not popping up there. Uh, this is a video of the radio telescope collecting data through the night. You can see that time lapse, how, lapse, how it's spinning around. Uh, but this isn't the telescope that y'all came to see. Yeah, no, y'all are probably here to see the telescope in the large silver dome, the Hobby Everly Telescope, which this program's about. So the Hobby Everly Telescope is named for the former Lieutenant Governor, William Hobby, who was a strong, longtime supporter of Texas astronomy, and Robert Everly, a donor for Penn State. Five institutions helped build the telescope, the University of Texas, Penn State, Stanford, the Ludwig Maximilius Universität, and the George August Universität, the last two being German universities. As you can tell, German is not one of my primary languages. And the Hobby Everly Telescope has a pretty unique design. When they were building it, they basically had one goal in mind. What's the biggest telescope we can make with the least amount of money? The unique design was made by two Penn State astronomers, Larry Ramsey and Daniel Weedman. And our telescope, it's about 10 meters in diameter, actually in a four-way tie for the second largest telescope in the world. Some of the other telescopes we're tied with for second largest in the world are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Each of those telescopes costs about $140 million to build, while the AGT only costs about $20 million. And that was when it was completed in 1997. Now we have added some upgrades since then, but we'll get back to that. Some of those cost innovations came from innovations in the motion of the telescope itself, as well as the telescope mirror. We looked inside that big silver dome. The Hobby Eberly telescope looks a little different than some other telescopes you might have seen. If you got any observations here, will you drop those in the chat? Uh, this Hobby Eberly telescope, like Saul said, is a 10 meter telescope. So the diameter of those mirrors is about 10 meters across, which is about the size of a school bus. Uh, fairly large. You can actually see there's a few people in the lower left down there. Um, shows you how big that telescope is. And actually, it's 11 meters tall. So though our 10 meter aperture sits at about 10 meters, the actual mirror space is a little bit bigger than those other telescopes, which I think we need to mention. Um, I don't see many observations in that chat, y'all. Come on, what do you notice? This telescope is a little different than the other telescopes you might have seen in the world because this telescope has an open truss system. There's not a big tube around it. And a lot of that had to do with weight. The more weight we put on it, like a big metal heavy tube, the more weight we have to move around. So it's cheaper to not move quite so much mass. So without a tube, uh, we saved some, some energy there. It does make us a little more susceptible to light pollution, which is why it's really important that we don't have people driving around on top of the mountains at night. We need the dark. 
The other thing you might be noticing on the telescope is that mirror. There's a lot of lines in it. Some people describe it as looks like a honeycomb or there's, you know, just little lines all over. And that is because the Hobby Everly telescope uses a bunch of mirrors lined up together to collect data on the universe. And most big telescopes around the world do use more than one. We use 91. Most telescopes use maybe seven. We found that by mass producing smaller mirrors, it was the most cost effective way to build a telescope. So with 91 one meter mirrors, we save some money there. Now each mirror does sit on its own set of actuators, allowing us to move each mirror. Uh, we can tip them, uh, tilt them, piston them, so we can line them all up as they need to be lined up. Um, the reason that the largest telescopes in the world do all need to use more than one mirror is because of the mass of those telescopes, those mirrors. Once they get too big, they don't maintain their shape. I can show you that. Have any of you played with one of these before? Got a, a measuring tape here. Y'all have done this. And if I keep doing this, eventually it's gonna fall. It can't maintain that, um, that shape. It can't hold itself up. There's too much measuring tape out, so it kind of falls. And that's kind of what happens with those mirrors. Once they get over about 8.4 meters, they're too heavy. They don't maintain their shape, which distorts the image that we're trying to collect. So if you're gonna make a telescope more than about 8.4 meters, you need to use more than one mirror anyways. And 91 smaller ones was, like I said, the most cost-effective way to do that. Yeah, so there were also some other big cost savings. One of them being the way the telescope itself moves. So most traditional telescopes have full range of the sky. They move up, down, left, right, diagonally because of the mount they're on. Not the Hobby Everly telescope. The Hobby Everly telescope can only move left and right, not up and down. It's stuck at a permanent 55 degree angle. The way it moves around is basically using air hockey table physics. We have some air bearings underneath the telescope that we fill up with air pressure equal to your car tires that is able to lift the telescope up and rotate it around. The telescope can make a, a full rotation up to about 420 degrees before we have to start spinning it back the other way so wires don't get tangled up. And the mirror is not the only thing that moves. Actually, the entire structure moves as well, including any of the instruments attached to it and the tracker that's on the top, which we'll get more into detail about later. But yeah, it's actually pretty cool just seeing this entire structure move around so quickly. And this isn't sped up. This is just how quickly the telescope actually moves. And once we get that telescope moved around and pointed, we need to let the light in. So on the outside of this dome, kind of hard to see in this image, there is actually a little door. This is not a little door, a big door over the window on the side of the telescope dome. Now, normally a telescope dome is it's called a slit. Uh, we've got a, a big you know, window there at the top and our telescope, our Hoppy Eblerly telescope has one panel that covers that window out to the sky. And when we're opening the telescope, it slides to the side on a track, allowing us to look out at the sky. And that top of the dome then where that one window is can spin around to look wherever the telescope is trying to point. So once that is open, then we can get the light in there because telescopes are collecting light. And to be a little more specific, they're collecting photons, those light photons that are shining down from those stars. I need you all to imagine a rainstorm. Okay, you step outside, and this is West Texas. If it's raining, we need to save that rain. It's a desert out here, which is why we get such clear images. But if it is raining, and you wanted to collect all those raindrops, what would you grab? I was in a high school class, a high schooler said a cup. Elementary school students, they said buckets. What do you think is gonna be the most effective means of catching raindrops? Cup, bucket. The wider that bucket is, the more raindrops you're gonna collect. Those light photons kind of work the same way. You can consider a telescope a light bucket because the screen y'all are looking at right now, that light is shining from the screen into your eyes. Those photons, your eyeballs are collecting. 
And if you scoot over to the side, there's more light photons coming from the screen. Same thing would happen if you step outside, looked at a star, your eyes are collecting those light photons. But if you step to the side, there's still light coming from that star. So the larger area our telescope has, the more light we can collect. Uh, there's another misconception that people get when they're looking at telescopes with multiple mirrors. And I gotta make it dark to show you this. All right, I have a pretend star here for you. It's a, it's a flashlight. I recommend y'all play with flashlights more often. This is my pretend star, and here is my pretend telescope mirror. It's a, it's a makeup mirror, but there's two mirrors there. Now, the Hobby Everly Telescope with 91 mirrors doesn't have lines in the view. That is not an issue because of the way a telescope works. All right, I'm just going to turn y'all a little bit here. My pretend star is shining light down onto my telescope here, and you can see that light is reflected on the wall there. Two different spots. That's with a flat mirror. If those mirrors are curved, you guys kind of see that? Kind of curved it in. I can curve those mirrors together. And now we have one spot of light that's brighter. Instead of two dim spots, one bright spot. And that is what we're doing with our 91 mirrors. We're turning them all perfectly so they line up and send the light into one spot. So all mirrors on telescopes have a curvature so that that light will end up where our sensor is. Yeah, so kind of going back to this tracker, the sensor that's on top earlier, that's where all the light is being focused to. So here we have a picture of our lead mechanical engineer, Emily Morzinski. And next her kind of for comparisons of size is the tracker. So the tracker goes across the mirror face, collecting light at different points to then go into a sensor. So in the sensor, in the tracker itself, is something called the IHMP, the input head mounting plate. So the light will go into the mounting plate and into a several sensors. So here we have a quick video of the tracker in motion. I can, as you can see, it can move closer and further away, across the mirror face, just gets to where it needs to be. In a traditional telescope, you can say the tracker acts as kind of like the secondary mirror in terms of positioning. So to get a closer look at it, we're going to see the IHMP close up. So here we have our input head mounting plate, and you see a bunch of little squares and circles scattered about. So those aren't just some weird bumps, but they're actually what we call IFUs, integral field units, and they contain fiber optic cables. The light from our 91 mirrors gets sent into those fiber optic cables, which then can go through the cables around, loop around, go into a knot, and still safely go into the respective instruments. All of, most of the ones you see here, the squares, go into an instrument called VIRUS, which was part of our latest upgrade. So VIRUS stands for Visible Integral Field Replicable Unit Spectrograph. So a spectrograph is a device that can gather light, and then we can break it apart into its components, into basically a rainbow, and find out more details about it. We're planning to have over 70 of these installed into the Hobby Everly Telescope as part of a project known as HETDEX, the Hobby Everly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. So we're looking at galaxies about 10 billion light years away and gathering light of over a million of them to try to answer one question. What is dark energy? So we know that the universe is expanding. And not only is it expanding, it's accelerating, getting faster. And we're not really sure why. We think energy's involved, but we don't know the type of energy or the source. We're not even sure if it really is energy. So we're calling it dark energy because we, more than anything, has a place for the name. So we're analyzing a small portion of the sky, kind of near the Big Dipper, that will, we will then look at those 1 million galaxies, use the virus instruments to then break down the light 
So kind of as you can see in this image, the the two right ones, there's they almost look like binoculars. The top, top one has a blue tinge, the bottom one has a yellow tinge, but that's actually a diffraction grading. Basically a prism that splits light up into rainbows. So we're doing this with about 1 million galaxies and getting an idea of how fast they're moving, how fast a galaxy moved 10 billion years ago, and then get a better idea of what dark energy is or isn't. Has the speed changed? Has it gone faster, slower? This dark energy a property of space? Does something create it? We don't really know, but we hope to figure that out very soon. Another cool upgrade that was added to the telescope is an instrument called HPF, the Habilo Zone Planet Finder. So we are looking at exoplanets with, with this instrument. Planets are outside and other solar systems. And then seeing of these planets lie in what we call the Habilo Zone, also nicknamed the Goldilocks Zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just the right set range of distance away from the star to it be, for it to be just right for liquid water. And the HPF itself has to be kept very cold at about negative 136 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are people that run these instruments. They have to keep track of them and make sure the data is being collected. So night operations happen. Typically, there's just two people. And historically, they were two people up at the telescope, up at the Hobby Everly, in a control room that looks a little bit like this. Since COVID, we just have one person up there. And that person at night is the telescope operator. The telescope operator is in charge of aligning the mirrors. And you can almost see a little image here of those mirrors. Over here is uh, showing how they're moving around, how the lineup is. They're also in charge of moving the telescope, right? Lifting it up on that cushion of air, spinning around and pointing it at the right object. And they're also in charge of the telescope's safety. So not only making sure that when they're turning it, it's moving safely, they are also in charge of the weather. You can see on this screen, right? One of seven screens is where we're looking at the weather outside, keeping an eye on the humidity, what that's doing. Um, if we get a spike in particle counts, maybe too much dust out here in the West Texas winds, um, they'll need to close up. And of course, if there is any rain on the way, they're the ones that have to make sure we close up that telescope dome nice and tight before anything hits those mirrors, because that is not something they want to deal with. Um, the other person that is working at night is the resident astronomer. And we have four resident astronomers that live here on site. Uh, one of the projects that they're part of is the DIM telescope. This is a smaller telescope that's outside, uh, keeps an eye on stars through the night to try and calculate how wiggly our air is, right? That atmospheric distortion um, kind of allows us to calculate how clear our evening is. But the resident astronomer is most importantly in charge of the data. They're deciding what we're going to point at next, make sure we're lined up on the right object that the astronomer is asking for data on, and they check the telescope data to make sure what's coming through is what the astronomer was asking for. This is the coolest image. Uh, when the visitor center staff got to go up to the Hobby Eberly one night over a year ago uh, and watch the operations happen, we took some data with the virus system. And like Saul said, we have over 100, what, um, 140 spectrographs installed at this point with our virus system. And you can see each of these squares shows that spectrum that came out of the virus units. Uh, now, I know when you're romantically thinking about the astronomers' jobs, you think of historically how our astronomers would look through the eyepiece and look out into the universe, and it's just amazing. This, however, with spectroscopy, gives us a lot more data. Looking at something like this, we can learn motions, content, temperatures, so we'll mention all of that. And with the virus, we're looking at so many different things all at once on that IHMP. So what was that? Yep. <laughs> yes. All right. The IHMP, the input so head mounting plate. That one, <laughs> input head mounting plate. We asked all the questions to get this ready for y'all. Um, so this was showing the data that we collected on an object while we were up there training. And we actually have today with us somebody who works during the nighttime. Uh, Justin Poutsky was hired here uh, six years ago almost to work as a telescope operator, moving the telescope at night and collecting data. 
Uh, since then, he learned the astronomer side of it. So now he is officially the HET observer and working as the operator or the astronomer on any given night for uh, operations. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull him over here. We're gonna ask him a few questions. This is what I want. Here we go. Uh, I don't know if you noticed the last name. Justin Poutsky lives here at my house. Uh, so we're gonna ask you a few questions. Justin, first, I want to know, how did you end up here as a TO, as an RA? Well, it was a long journey. Um, it really started probably in high school when I took a physics, a physics course, and that kind of piqued my interest um, in physics, and then there was a small portion of astronomy. I guess I didn't understand at that point that astronomy or science, scientists, that was a career field. So when I went to college, the first day that I was there, they asked me, what do you want to major in? And um, I was looking through a long list of majors and saw physics and thought, wow, I really enjoyed that in high school. And uh, I've always liked science. So I picked physics and I took a semester of physics and then I got into an introductory astronomy course and that basically started it as the professor came up to me and said hey i see you're a physics major do you want to try astronomy too i thought sure why not and uh fell in love with it from the first course on again still didn't realize that it was a career path until probably my second year of year of school and um then realized with our small observatories at the college I went to um, as an undergrad that, hey, observing is fun. I like observing. Uh, I like looking up at the sky and up at the stars. And I like thinking about the physical processes happening inside of the stars and in galaxies and all of that. And so I, I started looking around and realized that that could be a job. You could work at an observatory. You could uh, observe with large telescopes. And um, so I decided to continue my education and got my master's degree in astronomy, working with even larger telescopes, uh, moved up to a one meter telescope. Which was a big deal. I know we're talking about a 10 meter telescope. Most people haven't come near a 10 meter telescope. What was it, one meter at the SESU? One meter was the largest one they had there while I was there. Yeah. Big deal. <laughs> and that was a big telescope to me. That was a huge telescope to me and then um, my second year of my master's degree, we had a colloquium. That's a, that's a event that takes place in many astronomy departments. It's uh, where scientists visit and share their current research um, with the rest of the astronomy community. Um, in, in this setting, it's the, the, the department, but they kind of trade off between departments so that we all kind of hear what it, other people are doing in the field. And um, I talked to the person who had given the seminar and they, I told them, hey, I'm looking for astronomy jobs. And a couple months later, they, they sent my way a telescope operator job here at McDonald's. And that was just something I couldn't pass up, loving, loving observing. And uh, I got out here and it was beautiful and I got hired and it's been kind of a rush ever since. And I just can't help but continue taking in more and more of this uh, this observing experience. So starting as a telescope operator, I got to learn the ins and outs of all the engineering systems. And uh, the Hobby Everly is a very complicated telescope. And then as you know, learning the resident astronomer side of things, I got to enjoy taking the data and seeing the data come in and checking for quality and doing the astronomy related things to uh, you know fulfill my education um, so it's been it's been a good time and almost six years now and almost six years yeah. now yeah, yeah. Uh, so you say that the hobby ever leaves a unique telescope what is unique about that operation at night compared to other telescopes well um, you know when it was built it was pretty uncommon to have um, a segmented mirror especially one with say 91 segments uh, so aligning the mirror on the Hobby Everly telescope is, um, it can be challenging at times because not everything always lines up right away. And with temperature changes and such, mirrors end up kind of being pointed one way or the other. 
compared to where they're supposed to be. So the alignment itself is a sometimes complicated process. Uh, but on a good night, that happens fairly quickly, actually. Alignment actually happens within about 30 minutes or 30 to 40 minutes of the start of the night. So, And you uh, call that stacking, right? Yeah. Because we're stacking light on top of each other. Yeah, so basically when you're stacking, you are pointing all the mirrors at the same focus. And so if you think about the mirrors, if you think about each mirror has its own um, reflecting surface that focuses light to a point, then you think about all those points kind of up above the mirror somewhere. And if this mirror, say a mirror over here, is pointed a little out, that spot of light ends up a little over here. And if this mirror is pointing a little bit out this way, that spot of light ends up a little over here. And so you want them to converge to point their focused light at the same place. So we call it stacking because you're stacking the individual focused light points to the same area. You're stacking them on top of one another. Related to that, I think somebody dropped the, chat, the question in the chat what that tower was outside the, the Javi Eberle. That's related to the stacking. Yeah, the tower actually sits at the center of the curvature of, mirror, of the mirror. The mirror is a spherical mirror. Um, if you were to look at pictures of the Javi Eberle, you only see a small fraction of the sphere um, as the mirror surface. But where that tower is, is an instrument that looks down at the mirror and it basically breaks the light coming back from the primary mirror. It shines a light down on the mirror and then it breaks that light back up into, into its individual spots so that we can see each individual mirror instead of one whole mirror. Um, and then at that point, we can actually move individual mirrors and see their motions and, and be able to actually align them to where they ought to be to stack the combined light that's being created by the mirror onto one area. So it's a, it's a special set of instruments to do that. And another, another way that the Hobby Everly is unique is the Q system that we haven't even mentioned yet. Not all telescopes around the world use a Q system, but the Hobby Everly is pretty efficient in that way. Can you explain that system a little bit to us? Yeah, so many telescopes around the world, the astronomers apply for time through the, uh, you know, the, the observatories, and they get time on the telescope, and they physically go out to the telescopes and observe. With our telescope, our telescope is unique in the sense that it only is at one elevation. So that means that it can't really point up and down. It points kind of at one fixed angle in the sky. And so that means that not all targets are visible throughout the whole night. So when you want to observe something on the HET, applying for time, physically coming out and observing it would be rather difficult since your, your object may only be available to the HET for a few hours. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to have astronomers come out and observe using the HET. It makes more sense to have them submit a plethora of targets that are that can be observed throughout the whole night that may only pass into the HET's field of view for a couple hours. And then we can combine all of everybody's requests to fill the time that the HET has on night to, to observe the different areas of the sky as they become available. So the Q system for the HET is um, almost necessary. This is the most efficient way to run this large telescope. Um, the Q system, the way people apply is similar to how they would have applied for time on other telescopes, except for when they submit these proposals, they submit them to a, uh, to a committee that decides what priority level, how important are these targets, and how much time should we allot these targets for the science these people have um, suggested doing with this telescope? The Q system ranks them from P0 being the most important to P4. Uh, on, an, on a given night, most of the targets that we do are probably in the range of P0 to P2, uh, depending on how, how many targets we have left in the Q. If we have poor weather in a three month period, which is what we observe based on. They submit proposals for a three month period. Um, if we have poor weather, we might have a lot of high priority targets in the queue that need to be observed as soon as we can get them. And the lower priority targets, they get pushed aside for the moment. Hey, wait, what are some of the coolest P0 targets that y'all get to look at or look for? 
So some of the most exciting P0 targets that we look at are um, oftentimes are like supernovae, things that are only happening for a short period of time. Now, a supernova, it's not like an instantaneous thing. A supernova will brighten up over the course, brighten up and dim over the course of months. But you want to get on it as soon as it's discovered. So it is really important to, to get on top of those kinds of targets. Um, the other kind of targets that we have been looking for in the past, which we haven't lately, has been the, uh, we've been looking for gravitational wave um, counterparts. So if there's, say, two neutron stars that have um, in-spiraled together, when the big gravitational wave detectors like LIGO uh, try to they make a detection and they say, hey, there was a gravitational wave event, they try to narrow down the area in the sky where that event might have occurred. And so we go searching for it. We drop everything that we're doing when these events come up, if there's a good possibility, and we use virus to try to look for an optical counterpart to these gravitational wave events, which is super exciting. The virus has a, a really large area uh, that it can view in the sky. So it's a very good uh, device to be looking for. Um, if this is the kind of thing that the HET should have a big red phone for that would rain, but they don't. We have, we have, we have email alerts and, uh, you Not know, as fun. They, they're pretty quick when you're observing on the telescope. The upshot to the HET is if we do find an optical counterpart, not only will we have found it optically and we can reconstruct a kind of low resolution image using virus, but we've also gotten the spectrum for it. So that'd be super And that exciting. would be a first. This, that hasn't yeah. been seen before. So yeah. maybe Nobel stuff coming out of the HET someday. So keep trying. Yeah. Uh, I We get this question a lot at the visitor center, uh, people asking how to get their nieces or nephews or their grandkids interested in astronomy. So Justin, what would you recommend to our viewers to help get the next generation interested? Well, astronomy, as far as scientific fields goes, is pretty fortunate that it's something that is easily accessible. It's, it's, you know, as long as you have somewhat dark skies, you can go out and look at things related to astronomy. Uh, for young people, I'd start small. Go out and maybe talk about a couple stars that you can see in the sky, which you can even do in, in a well-lit city. There are still bright stars that are bright enough to see in most places. Um, and then move on to planets and talk about the planets. And um, the first thing I would say is, you know, be involved, get out there, have fun, enjoy it. Um, nothing kind of drives an interest more than the, 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 the joy of it, you know, for at least a kid, you know, kids like doing fun things. So um, I would say get out there and enjoy it. If you want to go further than that, you can get yourself a pair of binoculars. You don't have to have a high powered telescope to enjoy a lot of what's visible in the night sky, a pair of binoculars and uh, a tripod will do an awful lot. If you want to take the next step after that, there's uh, there's even more. There's uh, the amateur astronomer community. The amateur astronomy community is very large, I would say, across the nation. So um, events happen. Look for look for the term star party. You know that's that is a term that's used pretty frequently in just about every circle of astronomy. If you're looking for something to to go and see, um, look for a star party, and they're, they're the people that do these things, the amateur astronomers are pretty pretty knowledgeable and they uh, they do a very good job of spreading that joy and passion and knowledge along to people. So um, most, I'd look there. Most cities have an amateur astronomy club. You could, you could just Google your town and Google that for sure. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, colleges like putting on events like that as well. So keep an eye out for your, for a college that might be close by. Um, when I was a, a graduate student at San Diego State in California, uh, we put on a couple of them a semester and invited the public out to to see the stars and to to see different events. And if there was some sort of um, event going on during the day, like an eclipse or something, we'd invite them out to see that as well. So there's fortunately there is always something interesting happening astronomy wise, and it's usually fairly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, Astronomy is fortunate to have that. 
I know at UT they have star parties. Saul, can you jump in for a second? What what yeah. do they offer at U UT? Yeah, so currently not sure how the setup is with with the pandemic and such, mm -hmm. but well, the, traditionally what the programs are, they'll have two. There are actually two telescopes on campus that are available for public viewing. One on the roof of RLM that was usually done on Wednesday nights, and one on top of Painter Hall, which was done Friday and Saturdays. The one on RLM is just a traditional reflecting telescope, one of the newer ones. While the one at Painter Hall is actually a really old telescope installed in the 30s. It's a nine inch refracting telescope. So kind of the traditional ones one thinks of like, like the pirate ones almost. But as, and it has a really cool history. And before that, it belonged to a circus. Then before that, parts of it belonged to the Civil War general. So, and to do tracking, which is make the telescope move along the night sky at the same rate the Earth rotates at, they actually use, kind of wind it up. It's like an old grandfather clock where you have to wind it up, then it lifts the weight, and as it goes on, the weight falls and helps the telescope do tracking. Both of these telescopes are actually free for the public to use during this, well, not to use, but to look through during the star parties. So if you look on the UT website or look up UT Austin Star Party, they have more information about the times and the dates. The times sometimes change between the years and also the dates may vary depending on holidays or depending on if students are taking final exams or not. But and right now cool. things are probably different too. The what? And right now things are probably a little different too with, with COVID going on. But. Yeah. Probably, but once things calm down, do highly recommend it. Both telescopes are super cool. They both have their pros and cons, and it's just super fun. And it's free. Thank you, Saul. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have one question left for you. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the best part of being out here at the observatory? Well, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> There's actually a few of them. Um, it's really pretty out here, uh, and it's... It's uh, it's enjoyable to live in a place that's this beautiful. It's also enjoyable to live in a place that has dark skies like these uh, for people who like astronomy. Uh, and uh, I think the best part of all is I, I get to do for a living what I've kind of um, cultivated as a very strong passion of mine over the last several years. So, um, I get to continue being amazed by the universe, which is which is a, a good place to be for me. I think that's pretty across the board for most people that live here. We we mostly all love the location. It's just gorgeous. And the night sky. I, I always used to say after the full moon, a few days after that, it's dark at our star party time. And just re-seeing the darkness, it's just absolutely fabulous. The um, Milky Way will be coming back soon. And the Milky Way will be coming back. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see here. So we're getting towards the question time. I know a lot of you have been asking questions throughout. So we're gonna be looking in our, uh, with our mods, what kind of questions they have found for us. Um, but I do wanna take a second to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I do wanna let you know that the visitor center is open right now. Uh, we are doing programs, but they are very limited sizes. So they're selling out really quickly. If any of you are making plans for spring break, our spring break pass is sold out almost immediately. There is a wait list on the website. So certainly jump online, check that out, mcdonaldobservatory.org, put your name on a wait list. The system checks for available tickets at about 1 a.m. every day. And if it finds something available, it emails everyone on the wait list for that date. So um, you you can't be you know 400th on the list you could just be the first one back to buy those tickets and you win so it's it's worth a shot but just want to let y'all know we're it is our busiest week of the year and we're very limited at this point but keeping an eye on the website will let you know uh what's coming up and if we're able to release more tickets um, we are um hoping that things will start looking a little bit more and more uh, open in the next few months um, but everyone who wants to visit campus, even just drive around on site, we do need reservations because UT campuses um, have different regulations and procedures in place to keep everyone safe and healthy. So let's grab some questions. So we'll 
Yeah, so one that came in, actually kind of a thing I forgot to mention, or kind of you can say adding on to getting involved with your astronomy community, Austin does have astronomy on tap. So that's more for like the the, the older generations. So, you, so basically you get go to a bar or from what I heard with the pandemic, a live stream, and you have a, a professor or a graduate student or PhD student kind of just talking about a subject they really like in astronomy. And just, you know, explain it to the general public. And also, correction, the, the telescope is not on top of RLM. RLM's name actually got changed to PMA, Physics, Math, Astronomy Building. So thank you, Mary Kay Hemingway, for pointing that out. And there actually was a question that did come in for Justin. Does AGT study any gas and dust clouds? that are between us and a distant star by what spectrum is absorbed by, so the, by Tom Smith. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, HGT has a ton of different science that gets submitted each trimester. And uh, from the operation standpoint um, and the observing standpoint of the people out here, it's kind of hard to keep track of all of the different science that's uh, involved in, you know, with the HET. I do know that we study um, emission nebula. We study like uh, planetary nebula. So that would be gas that's being uh, possibly illuminated by a star between us and, you know, so between us and that star, there's uh, some gas that could be being observed that will be emitting light. So emission nebulae are generally what you probably call these gas and dust clouds that are between us and other stars. Uh, I know of a at least one such program that does something similar to that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, the, the big studies right now uh, on HET meaning that most of the observations that I do generally these days right now is HPF, habitable planet. Exoplanets are um, exoplanets are a very big uh, topic in astronomy at the moment. So a lot of the work that we do is either related to HETEX, which is that dark energy survey, or to looking for planets. Um, but there are smaller scientific programs that do things such as look at these gas and dust clouds. Yeah. Another question that our mods passed to us was, how do you protect the telescopes from earthquakes if that is relevant? And uh, Broken Wing, it is. If the, if the ground moves, our view of the sky is going to wiggle a bit. The Javi Eberly is um, probably one of the better protected from that because it sits on those air bearings. So it's basically just little rubber inner tubes. Um, and that sits the telescope on top of that. So if there were some sort of wiggling of the earth, it might ruin the exposure. That view might wiggle too much for us to you know, keep that data, uh, but the telescope itself should be fine. Um, and the piers that the telescope sit on also go down into the bedrock of the mountains. So there's not, there's a real strong base to hold everything in place pretty well. I don't think we've had too many issues out here at this point with um, earthquakes. So good question. From my understanding, um, earthquakes is not something we worry too much about um, out here. Justin, what software do you use for stacking? Pekka Hatula asks. Hatula. Well, uh, most of the software that we use in general is um, made by either you know, other scientific institutions or made in-house, made by the engineers that actually work on the HET. So, um, the piece of software, one of the pieces of software that we use was written by, um, I suppose it would be called Adaptive Optics Associates. Um, they are actually, it was put, the, the whole adaptive optics system to not necessarily do adjustments on the sky. This is adaptive optics in the sense that we move the mirrors to align them. Um, it's not adaptive optics as it's kind of talked about nowadays. Um, that system, as far as I know, was put together originally by um, people at NASA. So um, different people. It's uh, it, it wasn't made in house by us, but it's it's nothing that the general public will probably ever have to worry about using <laughs> or trying to get their hands on. So 
Uh, we do have currently an upgrade happening in our alignment system, um, an overhaul of that, that will have software that is completely written by people, um, by people who are partners with a large, large portion of that being written by people at UT. Uh, Hanshin Lee is actually the person leading it, the doctor leading it. So, yeah. Okay. So probably not something you can find at Best Buy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so question I just saw coming from Tom Smith. It would seem dirt and dust in the mirrors may be an issue in the West Texas desert. How often does the HET need to be cleaned and how is it cleaned? So dust really is an issue in West Texas. If it gets too dusty, it's better to just shut things down because we won't really be able to see anything. And yeah, we'll get the mirrors dirty. So the HET mirrors usually get cleaned about three times a week. And... Usually I like to ask people to guess what we use to clean the mirrors. So we sometimes get things like Windex, water, vinegar, air, some spit and elbow grease. But what we actually use is dry ice. Dry ice sounds like a really weird thing to use, but what happens to dry ice when it heats up? It sublimates. It goes straight from a solid to a gas. There is no look at phase in between that can cause smudging or imperfections. So they basically go into a lift, spray the mirrors down with pressurized dry ice snow, which knocks the dust off, and wait for it to sublimate. And then we're basically good to go. And in addition to the cleaning, um, the mirrors are recoded. Um, with the mirror alignment, you can kind of see which mirrors are dirtier, right? I thought we talked about that at one point. Um, so there is a camera on the HVT that looks down at the primary mirror and under blue sky light, you know, so like um, just before twilight, while it's still very bright out in the sky, it's very clear. You can take an image of the primary mirror from the tracker, the thing above the, the mirror looking down at it. And uh, blue light is the first light to start getting scattered out and to start so, so if, as the coatings thin, the blue response from the mirror drops significantly faster than other wavelengths. And so when you take this image, when you look at this image of just the primary mirror with blue light from the sky hitting the mirror and bouncing up uh, that you're capturing on the camera, you can kind of see which mirrors have thinner coatings because they're not as bright as the other mirrors. So, so they, yeah. they take um, those mirrors out that they prioritize it with that. And I know historically they tried to do about three mirrors a week or so. So we'd get through all 91 mirrors throughout the, the year. And then those mirrors get taken into a mirror coating lab uh, where they strip that previous aluminum coating and uh, resurface it. And we have about three extra mirrors so that when we take those three out during a week to recoat them, there's not like holes where mirrors should be. There's always enough extras. And I know the uh, the public lobby where we typically get to bring visitors into, hopefully again soon, uh, there's a model in there with a real mirror. So we hope that all the other ones keep working because otherwise they'll steal their model back and we talk about that. So we'd like to keep on, hold on to that. Um, any other Oops. questions? Yeah, so there's one, I'm guessing it's for Justin as well, from Charles Phillips. Uh, do they have shifts where people work nights for several shifts and have a few days off where they're, they are awake during the day? So um, when we're in normal operation, uh, unlike some telescopes, like say, I know um, Gemini, at least last time I looked there, they used to do a seven days on, seven days off rotation. We don't, we do a, um, we have kind of an interesting setup. So a normal shift for me would be three days of setup, which is where I come on in the afternoon and I do a whole bunch of checks to make sure the telescope is ready to go for the night. Uh, both the telescope operator and the resident astronomer have their own ops that they do in the afternoon. So this would be similar for both of those positions. Mm -hmm. um, so they do a, a few days, three or four days of this setup in the afternoon where they check all the systems to make sure that we're not going to lose time on sky at night fixing something. Um, and that's uh, two, depending on the season, that might be two hours, that might be a, a four hour shift um, in the afternoon. And then after those three or four days of checks, you then go on to overnights for three or four days. And so, um, 
it's possible that you're once you're done with your overnights for three or four days that you're going to have somewhere between four to eight days of time where you're not working. So you could shift to a day schedule. Um, several people do that. You know, out of our staff of eight, we have quite a few people who shift to a day schedule between these shifts and quite a few people who like to stay in between. Like um, instead of staying up till sunrise on their days off, they'll stay up till two to four in the morning and go to bed and wake up a little bit earlier. Um, so everybody kind of manages that a little different, but we don't really get the, the seven days on, 14 days off or seven days on, seven days off mm -hmm. rotation that some places do. But that overnight shift is sunset to sunrise for yeah. one person. So it's, it's not like there's shifts during a given night. No. Um, we had another question come in. Uh, how are you working around local light pollution for nearby towns and the industries? Um, Oscar, we have ordinances in place for the surrounding seven counties. And unfortunately, some of the verbiage is a little dated on there. It doesn't um, really uh, account for the LED light lighting, which is a kind of a new setup, a different situation where not only should that like filament be covered, LEDs work a little differently. Uh, Stephen Hummel, our dark sky specialist, might have dropped in the chat some information for you. I know he is working to um, work with the different townships and the different counties in the region to update that verbiage so that it is properly um, effective for the lights that we buy and put on houses now. Um, so at this point, it's it's ordinances that we're, we're encouraging people to keep lights pointed down covered and off at night if they can, but none of us want people to be unsafe. So if you need a light on your sidewalk, like that's okay. Just make sure the light is shining where you need it to be on the ground. So, all right. Uh, we should probably start wrapping up here. So will you have any other questions you see? Uh, let's see. Ooh, from Time Pick. Do you think Starlink will cause any problems when fully developed? So Starlink is a big topic in the astronomy community. So for those of you that don't know, Starlink is basically a satellite system set up by Elon Musk to give global internet by a satellite. Really cool idea, really cool thing to do. But the satellites are really bright and they can get interfere with our observations. So. Let's say, oh, you want to take a picture of your family. It's a very nice moment. And right when you take a shot, a bird flies by. Well, you have to take the shot again. That image kind of got ruined. But imagine that happening with thousands of birds once it's fully developed. That's kind of the big concern with Starlink once it reaches its full potential. You have kinds of things going to the field of view. There could be risk of it interfering with your observation and Honestly, it's just something the astronomy community is still trying to like figure out what a good solution could be or what could be done. Because again, global internet is really cool, but it's kind of have to find a way that the Starlink satellites could be made without interfering that much with astronomical observation. Uh, one last question. Have... Oh, sorry, I didn't know like if y'all had anything else to like add to it. Um. So. Uh, we're currently studying or currently trying to work to figure out how much that's going to affect the telescope. I know that there's been some work done by um, Stephen Janowicki and Stephen Hummel that they tried to capture a Starlink uh, pass with both virus and, um, you know, a virus and then one of the telescopes down at the visitor center. So, um, we're trying to figure out how much that's going to affect the instruments that we have. Um, this is a large problem for people who have a larger field of view. Uh, that's that's the thing. We're, we're fortunate that some of the instruments that we have are looking at such a small portion of the sky that um, it's very unlikely that it'll be obscured by something. But yeah, that's currently being looked at to figure out how, how much is that gonna affect us. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. I'm going to drop in one quick last question. Somebody asked how often we have to polar align the mount and how long are exposures. Um, so I know the, the older telescopes are polar aligned and those are huge mounts that don't move or change. So they, they don't polar align them, I guess. At the visitor center, 
we, you know, reset where something is for tracking, but the, the mount itself stays. How long exposures are, the bigger telescope you have, the more light you can collect in less time. So shorter exposures on the HET could be a couple of minutes. The smaller telescope though, at 107 inch, which is still huge, it could be hours. And we can do up to two and a half hours on the HET, correct? So with the HET, the HET is a unique telescope because it can't point up and down. It can only see kind of a, I'll call it a belt on the sky. So if you imagine a sphere around the earth that is the, the sky, the stars that we see, imagine um, a kind of belt that goes around one area of the sphere. If you were looking in two dimensions, you'd call this a chord of a circle, right? It's just a small area of that circle. Um, and so we're limited in our exposure time by how long the star is in that small region, that small belt in the sky. And so um, on average, most of our exposures are um, in the 15 minutes to 45 minutes range, uh, with a lot of our targets being about 30 to 35 minutes. And uh, the other thing about HET is that because of how the tracker needs to move in order to see that belt in the sky, you're only getting a certain portion of the mirror at any one time. So at the very beginning, when that star just enters that belt, you might be only getting a six and a half to seven meter portion of the mirror. And then as it gets to the center of the, the region, that belt, the, the center of that time frame, then you're getting closer to 10 meters on the HET. And then as you move closer to the edge again, you're losing more and more mirrors. So another reason you know, that we do the Q observing is that we can optimally observe as many of these targets as possible so that they get as much light as they can from the primary mirror. So um, generally our exposures don't last more than an hour, but uh, there is occasions where we have exposures that take up the whole time that that star is available inside that region and um, that could last, yep, on the order of nearly two and a half hours for some of the northern trajectories, the northern areas, because of how the sky is moving relative to where we're looking. All right. So thank you for joining us, Justin. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. We hope you learned a lot about the Hobby Everly Telescope, part of the McDonald Observatory. So, yeah. Yeah, if you all like to learn more about our programs or visit our virtual gift shop or even see a catalog of our past live streams, just go to our website, mcdonaldobservatory.org. Also, if you're more interested in the Hetedex project and want to help out a bit with it, you should check out Zooniverse and download the app. There you can help identify signals from very distant galaxies and help out with the HET. And I hope you all enjoyed. We hope to see you in West Texas in the future. And until then, Clear skies. Clear skies, everyone. <laughs>